Welcome to Bridgeway. Thanks so much for joining us, whether you're here in the room or joining us on Facebook or YouTube. We are so honored that you spend part of your Sunday with us. Uh, like Wes said, we are in week four, the final week of this series called Repraise, where we're taking a microscope, we're taking a deep dive look into what is worship. Why do Christians do it? Why, what is it? Is it like the Jesus karaoke thing? Like, is it just the warm up before the message? Like, why do uh, Christians, when they gather together, uh, sing songs together? Which I think is a great question that we've been talking about. And throughout this series, uh, we've really taken a lot of time to experience and to learn together, to journey together towards what actually happens. Like, how do we praise God? How do we worship? And we've actually looked at these Hebrew words that are all translated to our English word praise that are found in the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, or the pre-Jesus stuff of our Bible. Uh, we've said that, you know, in the English language, there are, uh, there's just one word for the word love, um, but, uh, we, and we get a lot of yardage, we get a lot of uh, uh, mileage out of the word love. We say we love our spouse after 50 years, but we also say I love tacos, right? We say that together. Uh, but the Hebrew language uh, actually has all this nuance inside of it, and it's, it's much more about meaning than it is exact nature of words in the Hebrew language that the Old Testament was written in. And there are actually seven words that are translated to the English word praise. And I think as we dive into all of these words, all seven of them, we get a better picture how praising God, worshiping God is like looking at a diamond and having all these different surfaces that light reflects off of. And it's beautiful and it's bigger, it's wider, it's stretchier than we possibly could have imagined. It's actually a beautiful thing. I believe that when we worship God, we are joining this eternal current that's been going on uh, for all of eternity, and we actually live into part of our purpose as humanity when we praise God for all that he is, and we praise him in all the ways that he's called us to praise him. So that's what we've been talking about. Uh, in a way of review, here are some of the Hebrew words that we've looked at and looking at the different angles of praising God uh, as, before we get going deeper. Here's where we started. Three weeks ago, we talked about the word halal. Can you guys say on the count of three, halal? One, two, three, halal. This is where we get the English word hallelujah. It's the most common word translated for praise in our Bibles. It means to rave, to boast, to celebrate, to be clamorously foolish. This is the idea. You don't care who's around you at all. You're so enamored with what God has done for you and who God is that you're just going crazy. You're being a fool praising him. You're halaling him in that way. Here's the second Hebrew word, word we looked at three weeks ago, shabak. Count of three. Can you guys say shabak? And there's nothing subtle about shabak, right? Uh, one, two, three, shabak, right? You have to get a lot of hunk going on there for shabak, but I love it because it sounds in a way uh, that it, what it actually means in the definition. It's to address in a loud tone, to commend passionately, to shout in triumph. We talked about some cultural shabaks that we've seen, like back in 2016 when the Cubs, I'm sorry, Cubs fans, sorry, but let's remember happy times. They won the World Series 100-year drought. There were, it was like the seventh largest gathering of people ever getting together to celebrate this shabak, to make a big, loud noise about it. And we're, we're told that we're supposed to do that. We're designed to do that towards God because of what he has done for us as well. So that's a way that we praise God. We also talked about this in week three, yada. Yada is where we get the idea of people lifting their hands in worship and in praise because yada means to revere or worship with extended hands, to lift the hands in a way of saying, oh, we are so desperate, we're surrendering to you in a way of so much awe and wonder of who God is, we lift our hands before him as well. This is how we yada. And we also talked about this word, Barak, to bow, to go low before the king, to bless royalty. We talked about in the ancient world how this was a very common practice to where when people would walk into the courts of royalty, they would get down on one knee and they would keep eye contact with the royalty the whole time in a way to bless them, to show honor to them. We said that when we Barak, we are saying that there is a king and it is decidedly not me at all. And we honor God in this place of royalty that he is. Then last week, if you are with us, we had a guest speaker, uh, Katie Scott from one of our partner churches in Logansport Revolution Community Church. Uh, she leads the teaching team there. And she taught on this incredible Hebrew word, todah. It's not tada, it's toda, uh, and this is the idea of toda, is thanking God for things not yet received, raising your hands to God for what he has and has not done yet. Katie shared that toda is the praise of faith. It's the praise when we're in a valley and we decide, we choose to praise God 
anyway. And we see incredible things happen, not only in our circumstances, but in our hearts when we take this posture of todah. And so you can see from these first five words we looked at, man, worship is so much more than Jesus karaoke. Worship is so much more than the warm-up before the talk. It's this beautiful picture of how we're supposed to respond to God, not just with our mouths and the words that we say, but with our whole lives, a full-bodied expression. So this is how we've been talking about worshiping. Another question that we've been answering throughout the series, and I think it's a great question if you've been asking it, is this question right here. Why do Christians worship? Like, you're telling me all the hows on how to do it, but maybe for you, uh, maybe you're like, so why do we do it over and over again? Why is it like a rhythm of church services and a rhythm of life? And like I said, I think this is a great question. If you're, uh, you know, you're skeptical about Christianity, about the Bible, if you don't really get it, I think this is a great question to ask because I don't want to ever do something just because grandpa told me to do it. <laughs> I don't want to do something just because it's what you're supposed to do. I want to understand it, and I think even if you're skeptical about faith, Jesus, the Bible, this is a great question to ask because we don't want to do things just because we're supposed to either way. There's got to be good reasons behind it. And so we've talked about some of the reasons why Christians worship. We talked on week one about the reality that I say this all the time, that you worship and you just can't help yourself. That worship is not a Christian thing. Worship is a human thing. And when you bare bones get down to the root of what worship really is, it's just your human response to what you value the most. That's what worship is. It's your response to what you value the most. And so you can ask yourself what you're worshiping um, by where does your mind, and your, when you have some idle time, where does your mind wander to? Uh, you can ask yourself what you're worshiping by what's filling up the biggest blocks of your free time in your calendar. That's what you're responding to. You're valuing the most. Uh, you can answer this question by if you've got some extra cash, what are you wanting to spend that money on? What are you planning, dreaming about spending that money on? Man, that's oftentimes What we're responding to is what we're valuing most in that way. And we say that it's actually the best thing for you to point that adoration, that response to what you value most to Jesus. Because in week two, he said this, that you become like what you behold. You guys picking up what I'm putting down there? You and I, we become like what we behold, what we focus on, what we adore. We become like that thing. This is the reason why in the 1990s, when boys and girls in their driveways, they would, would learn how to shoot a left-handed layup, they did it with their tongue sticking out of their mouth because they were looking at Michael Jordan. This is the reason why kids playing basketball today flop because they're watching LeBron James. <laughs> Zing, all right? We become like what we behold. And this is so important because I, we be, if we behold Jesus, if we worship Jesus, we become more like him. We're formed in this way like him. And the, author of the authors of the New Testament describe this. We start to experience the fruit of the Spirit, or we start to experience these characteristics of Jesus' life. We start to look more like joy and peace and self-control and love and kindness and gentleness. That's what we start to look like when we behold Jesus and we point our worship in his direction We become like that. And that's important to me um, because at the end of my life, when people are going to line up at my funeral, at my viewing, I want people saying those things about me. (laughs) I want my legacy not to be what I built, what I accomplished, how much money I made, or if I made a name for myself. I want people to say, oh, Joel, he exemplified kindness and joy and peace and love and grace and self-control. I want those things said about me. And I believe that you do as well. And that's important because we become like what we behold. So that's part of the reason this is why we worship you guys. Uh, Not because we're just supposed to, but because it does something in us. It reorients us to the ultimate reality that there is a king and it is decidedly not me. And I don't know about you, but life is too crazy too uh, much of a storm for me to try to navigate this on my own. Maybe I'm just speaking for myself, but I can't on my own. And I need to be reoriented to the reality that there is a king and his name is Jesus. It's not Joel. Okay, that's why we've been talking about Christians and why they worship. But today we've got two more Hebrew words to finish up our diamond that we're looking at of what it means to praise God. So you guys ready to do a little bit of Hebrew I had one person said, yeah, it was a, I guess we're going we're gonna to go there e- anyway, right? So here is the first word we're looking at today. Word number six is the word zamar. On the count of three, can you guys say zamar? One, two, three. Zamar. 
Zamar, right? And Zamar is this, to touch the strings or part of a musical instrument. Zamar has not, nothing to do with what's coming out of our mouth, but it has to do with just the instrumentation of music. It's somebody playing an instrument. This is a way that we praise God is through instrumental music. And uh, I don't know if you guys have thought about this or if you guys have ever learned any of these things, but I did in my study this last week that I'm just coming to find that music and instrumentation in music is a phenomenon. I mean, it is this crazy, scientific, mystical thing that happens uh, when people actually play music. I learned so much about this this last week. Do you guys know that there um, are certain house plants that respond and grow and grow taller if somebody pipes in music through a speaker near the plant? I mean, I learned this. There's this guy named Don Carlson in the 1960s, and he, he, he thought that this might be a thing. And so he got this plant. It's a house plant called a purple passion plant, and they usually grow up to be about a foot tall. So, you know, not real small, but a little guy. He started piping in uh, orchestral music right into this plant. And his plant, his purple passion plant, because of the music, he says, uh, grew to 1,300 feet tall, you guys. And in his Guinness Book of Records, you can look this up. Uh, he, he just believed that music can actually help plants grow in a powerful way. He actually sold an auditory fertilizer later and made a bunch of money. I love it. He called Sonic Blooms is what he called it. But there are certain plants in the nature around us, in the created order, music helps these things in nature respond and grow. Have you guys, let me ask you this, have you guys ever experienced and had goosebumps while listening to music, being around music? Anybody else? Am I the only one? Goosebumps, right? You know, it's kind of crazy because I think in our design, in our biology, we were actually created to um, have this, this connection with music. And actually, what scientists have discovered that when you get goosebumps listening to music, there is a neurotransmitter called dopamine that's actually released in your body when you listen to certain songs, when you listen to certain music. And dopamine is this neurotransmitter that is designed to reward your body. It's the same thing that happens when you take a long nap. If you've got toddlers, you know that's like close to heaven, right? You take a long nap, you get a dopamine hit. When you have sex, you have a dopamine hit. When you eat a great meal, uh, you have a dopamine hit. When you hear an incredible guitar solo with a distortion and it's played perfectly, you can get a dopamine hit. We're sort of wired to have this happen inside of our bodies. God created you like that for music to be something that releases this joyful neurotransmitter in your body. Here's the craziest one to me. Uh, you guys know what drum lines are? You know, it's guys or girls getting together and they're playing a piece of music together, all hitting their different drums, but they're all orchestrated together. Uh, do you know that, when, that scientists have discovered that when people practice a piece of music for a long uh, period of time in a drum line, that they're not only syncopating together with their hands as they hit the drums, but something even deeper starts to happen inside of their bodies. Scientists have discovered that they practice a piece of music over and over again, that their heartbeats start beating at the same beat per minute. Do, 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 right? I mean, it's kind of crazy, right? It's not just outside of them, but their hearts are beating at the same rhythm. Almost like music has this power to unify people from different socioeconomics, different body chemistries, different ways of looking at the world, but somehow music can unite people and even unite people down to the beat and the rhythm of their heart. Music is a phenomenon, guys. And I'm just going out on a limb here. I, I don't, I'm not saying there's like a verse in the Bible that tells us this, but I think music was created by God and it was created for God. And it leads us breadcrumbs to the very origin of music being an access point of our souls opening up to experience God. It opens up our souls to experience God in a powerful way. That's what music is. And that goes to the heartbeat of what Zamar is all about, playing an instrument. Here's where Zamar is a couple times in the book of Psalms. And just a heads up, if you haven't been with us, we've talked about the book of Psalms. It's actually the largest portion of the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament. It's full of all these old worship songs, prayers, a bunch of rants and laments. So people at the top of their life praising God and people at the bottom saying, God, where are you? It's got the whole gamut inside of it. It's like the whole human experience with God inside the book of Psalms. And we've said that all seven of our Hebrew words are found in the book of Psalms. So here's an example of Zamar to touch and play an instrument. Uh, I will sing a new song to you, O God, on a harp of ten strings. I will sing praises, Zamar, there's our word, to you. The one who gives deliverance to kings, who delivers David his servant from the deadly sword. 
I love here the psalmist uses some poetry to tell us here that um, he will sing praises, but not with his mouth, not with his lips, but he'll sing praises by touching his, uh, his, his harp of ten strings, which like sounds so rock and roll, a harp of ten strings, right? But this is how he's praising God, and, and this is how he's celebrating God. The next psalm I want to look at, just to give us a little bit of context, here's uh, King David. And he's actually before he was King David. David is responsible for about two-thirds of all of our psalms in the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, But at this point, uh, it's very important to know where David was when he was writing this. The book of Psalms tells us he's writing this specific psalm when he's hiding in exile in a cave. And you may be like, why is David hiding in a cave in exile, right? Well, there's King Saul is actually, he wants David killed. And so David had to book it out of town, and he's hiding in a dark dungeon of a cave And we see David, this is where he is when he's writing this song. In the lowest moment of David's life, this is what David is singing. Here's the next psalm. David says, my heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and give praise, Zamar, play for you. Awake, my glory. Awake, lute and harp. I will awaken the dawn. My friends, this is the first example in human history of someone playing the blues on a lute and a heart. Doesn't that sound good? The lowest point of his life, what does he decide to do? One way he's going to praise God is not just with his lips, not with his words, but he's going to play on his instrument and pour his heart out to God and make much of God with his hands as he touches the strings of an instrument on a lute and on a harp. This is what Zamar is all about. It's using instrumentation, using our gifts as musicians, if you're a musician, to set the stage to praise God in a unique way. There's this account found for us in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, the book of 2 Kings, chapter 3. And just to set the stage a little bit, God's people, the Israelites, uh, they're, they're lining up for a war against the Moabites. But there's one big problem. There hasn't been rain for a long time, and all of God's people's reserves for water are almost empty. And so the Hebrew officials are, like, looking for help from other nations. They're, they just, like, ultimately go, oh, we need to find a man or a woman of God, and we need a miracle. And so they go looking for somebody to help them out so that God would miraculously, supernaturally provide the Israelites with water. And so they go into the town, and they don't find the big-name prophet of Elijah, but they find his servant boy, a little minor prophet, if you will, Elisha. And they're like, well, I can't find Elijah, so we'll just ask Elisha. Elisha, can you do something? Can you bring a miracle? Can you bring us water? Because we are on uh, the edge of our seats. This is going to be defeat of God's people. We need a miracle. We need intervention from God. Elisha, can you help us out? And I imagine Elisha was like, okay, I've never done this before, but I'll step up to the plate. This is maybe my moment, and let God use me in a powerful way. And uh, so you might think Elisha, he's setting up, this is his moment for him to be a big, bad prophet, to bring a miracle for his people. You might think, okay, I need to see the strategy and see uh, what are our military officers saying to neighboring nations that could give us water. Or you might think he's saying, okay, well, let's go look at the weather and let's see what we can get here, uh, how we can move forward to make this happen with work of their own hands. But no, he doesn't say anything like that. Elisha, when it's his moment to perform this miracle, to bring water for his nation, his people, this is what he says next. Now bring me a harpist. Bring me somebody that can play the heck out of a harp. Is basically what he says. He's like, oh, we need some music up in here. We need an underscore. We need to set the stage for God to do something cool. This is not what you'd expect, right? But Elisha understood the power of Zamar and how it can set a moment, how it can bring God's presence in a unique way for people to experience him. And this is what happens next. When the harpist was playing, the hand of the Lord came on Elisha and said, this is what the Lord says. I will fill this valley with pools of water, for this is what the Lord says. You will see neither wind nor rain, yet this valley will be filled with water, and you, your cattle, and your other animals will drink. This is an easy thing in the eyes of the Lord. He will also deliver Moab into your hands. And that's exactly what happened. (laughs) Elisha understood the power of Zamar, of music being played, to set the stage, to praise God so that it opens up the atmosphere and opens up our spirits and our souls to what God might have next. Let's move forward about 1,600 years, probably actually 2,600 years, a little under 3,000 years, and we're introduced, the world is introduced to the genius of Johann Sebastian Bach. He was one of the best composers the world had ever seen. You probably heard the melodies of his music in Trans-Siberian Orchestra or actually played on strings and orchestral plays as well. 
But uh, Bach was actually a follower of Jesus. He loved God. He was a student of the scriptures. He was a follower of Jesus. And actually, on most pieces of Johann Sebastian Bach's music, there were three letters, initials, SDG, which was Latin for soli deo gloria, which meant glory to God alone. There was no singing in Bach's music, but it was to glory of God alone that he wrote his music. I love this quote from Johann Sebastian Bach. He said this, I play the notes as they are written, but it is God alone who makes the music. Bach understood that even without English words, even without the uh, sung words, that it can be praised as someone with expertise and uh, with practice and with careful practice and delivery. It can set the stage in a beautiful way. So what I want to do in the next couple minutes, just for two minutes, I want to show a video of one of my, uh, the, I guess I'm going to say one of my favorite cellists, the only cellist I know, Yo-Yo Ma. Uh, he's actually performing a, Sebast- a Johann Sebastian Bach piece. And as we listen to this, I just want you to like take a sit- seat back and just like let the wonder of the beauty of this music wash over you. Remember that God is the author of this beautiful music. And let's just um, remember how it, connect, it can connect people and unify people from all over the world with this wonder of music, Zamar. Check this out. Rock and roll, right? <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? My friends, I believe that music was created by God and for God. It creates an access point in our souls to experience him and have wonder towards him. And that is what Zamar, praising him with instruments, is all about. Our last Hebrew word, our seventh Hebrew word that we're looking at in the month of July is the word tehillah. Da, 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 da. Tehillah, right? <laughs> Some of your favorite Hebrew words ever. Tehillah is where we get the idea of the book of Psalms. It's actually called the Tehillim uh, because the definition of Tehillah is this, as a song of praise, a new song, a spontaneous and personal song, <laughs> That's what a tehillah is. That's how we praise God with tehillah. It's a personal song. We all know this just from the human level, right? There's sometimes artists sing songs that they wrote, and it moves us deeply because they experienced it. I would say that if you've heard Adele sing, hello from the other side, and didn't have like goosebumps once, where's your heart? Right? She experienced that. Hearing Jeff Buckley sing the classic Hallelujah, hearing Chris Martin from Coldplay crying out, I will try to fix you, or Olivia Rodrigo driving by her ex boyfriend's house. That gets you, right? It gets you. It gets me. It's real because it's something they experience. It's personal to them, and they're pouring their heart out, expressing it. This is what God is after in my worship and in your worship. Something not rehearsed, not something professional, but something authentic, real, and personal. We see the, uh, the word tehillah all the way throughout the Psalms. We see it here. Um, we see uh, the psalmist says, but you are holy, your other... You're enthroned, you, or you dwell in the praises, the tehillah of Israel, your people. Our fathers trusted you. They trusted, and you delivered them. They cried to you, and, you, and they were delivered. They trusted in you and were not ashamed. See the personal nature of this tehillim? Uh, we, we see here that like the fathers of Israel, they experienced God's rescue and their good and his goodness. And then they just respond by singing their praises to him. It's not something that happened to other people. It's something that happened to them, and that's why they're singing. Here's another example of Tehillah. We see this in Psalm 78. Incline your ears or bend your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable or a story. I will utter dark sayings of old. Or in other words, we're going to sing like things that have been said for a long period of time, which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us. And I highlighted that phrase because I love it so much. Because it's not just something that was passed down to you that you've heard about, but it's something that you have known. And the Hebrew word for known is an intimate word. It's the word yada, I mean yada, not yada, yada, like yada, 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 I know, I know, I know. It's the word to really experience and know, Um, and that's what they're saying. They're saying this is not something we've heard about, but we've experienced God's goodness, his rescue, his mercy, and his grace. We will not hide them from their children, telling to the generations to come the praises, the songs of praise of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done. This is not just something rehearsed, professional, passed down. It's something that they experienced and knew on a deep, deep level. This is what Tehillah is all about. 
And my friends, this idea of singing a spontaneous, personal celebration and praise to God, it is deeply woven into the narrative of the scriptures. We can go all the way back to the beginning of the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, and we see in this poem in Genesis 2 about creation, we see the moment that like uh, Michael Bolton gets set loose, and it's like when a man loves a woman, right? Because we see Adam is all by himself without a counterpoint for his soul, without a helper, without a partner to help him go through life. Uh, we see that he is lonely, but we're, what happens when he experiences uh, having a woman, a partner there? He breaks out into song. We see here in Psalm or Genesis 2.20, uh, 2, for Adam had no suitable helper that was found, so the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. Sidebar, ladies, men have been falling into deep, deep sleep since the very beginning. Um, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. This is when you... When a man loves a this is when that happens, right? And the text tells us the man said, but most Hebrew scholars believe it should be better translated, the man sang. Because what we see next, the Hebrew words actually rhyme like a song or a poem. So the man sang these words. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman for she was taken out of man. He experienced something so good he couldn't just tell you about it and talk to you about it. He had to sing it. That's his tehillah. He's so grateful towards God. He just had to respond in a personal song. The next part of the Hebrew scripture is the book of Exodus. We see God's people. They had been in slavery for generations, in hard slavery, but God sent God heard the cry of his people and sent his messenger Moses, his servant Moses, to set them free. And they're finally getting out of Egypt. <laughs> they're finally getting out of Egypt. They cross, uh, they get right to the Red Sea, think there's no way they could cross. God performs this crazy miracle of parting the Red Sea. All of God's people pass. And as the pursuing chariots of Egypt come, the water crashes down over them. And God's people are truly saved. And what does Moses do when he gets to the other side? He breaks out into Tehillah. He breaks out into a song, and he says this. He sings this. Uh, I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. Both horse and driver he has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. I love that phrase, because in our evangelical church thinking, we think of salvation as that thing that happens, so we don't go to the bad place, we go to the good place. And that's a thing, but we're, what we're really looking at here is Moses saying, no, you have saved me right here, right now, not sometime in my future. You are my salvation. You have become that for me. And so he's singing this. He is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God. And I will exalt him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord, or Yahweh, is his name. What's he do? He breaks out into song. We go into the New Testament, and the Gospel of Luke, one of the biographies of Jesus' life, tells us in the very first chapter that there is this lowly servant, teenage girl who has this messenger from God saying that, hey, you are going to give birth to the Savior of the world, the Messiah that everybody's waiting for. You're going to bring him into this world. And what does this lowly servant girl, this teenager girl, what does she do? She breaks out into song. Luke 1 tells us this. This is the song that Mary, the mother of Jesus, sings. My soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. She's basically saying, I'm a nobody, but Jesus called me to this incredible work. I'm a nobody. I'm a servant girl. But he's called me. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, not because of something she's done, but before the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. Mary, the mother of Jesus, breaks out into Tehillah to praise God with his personal, spontaneous song. We look through church history, and we see artists do this as well. Uh, this is a picture of John Newton. John Newton is the songwriter of the most classic hymn probably ever uh, recorded, Amazing Grace. And we think about John Newton writing this song. We think, oh, what an incredible saint of a man. But John Newton's backstory is pretty dark. Uh, John Newton actually made his wealth. He made his fortune by being a slave trader, taking ships from America and Great Britain to the continent of Africa, uh, loading up African men and women and bonding them in the bottom of ships and bringing them back to be sold like cattle. But you know what? Jesus got a hold of John Newton's life. <laughs> and flipped him upside down. And he experienced this incredible grace that only could come from Jesus. And his life turned upside down. And he became a songwriter, and he wrote these words in Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound 
that saved a wretch like me. John's talking about his own life that saved a wretch, a wreck, a broken mess of a person like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I can see clearly. He wrote those words from an experience of his own life. But what I love so much about John Newton's story isn't that he just was a recipient of God's grace. He later, after becoming a Christian, became an agent of God's grace. Uh, When it came time that he got back to England after he had stopped being a slave trader, he actually was on the front lines of abolishing slavery in the country of Great Britain. He said that this is an injustice that I played a part of, but it is an affront to God and man, and I am not standing for it anymore. And he was part of the reason that slavery ended in Europe. Not just a recipient of God's amazing grace, but an agent of God's amazing grace too. Ooh, man, I want to be more like him in my day and age. (laughs) But that's what he did. This was his tequila, this story of amazing grace. Here's a picture of a guy by the name of Horatio Spafford. Uh, He was a songwriter. A hym- hymnist in America, he actually had a wife and four daughters that were taking a transatlantic ship uh, a, you know, across from America to Europe, and tragically, there was a shipwreck, and all four of his daughters passed away. They were, they were killed in this shipwreck, and a couple weeks later, all, uh, you know, all Horatio got was a, a note from his wife saying, all four are dead. What are we to do now? Can you just imagine the lowest of the low of that experience. So Horatio got on a boat and he was going to mourn with his wife to do the best to grieve the loss of their four young daughters. And on the way from America to Europe on the ship, he pinned these words. (laughs) He pinned these words, when peace like a river attendeth my way. In other words, when life is great, but also uh, when sorrows like sea billows roll. That's what he was feeling in that moment. He said, whatever my lot thou hast taught, you have taught me to say that it is well, it is well with my soul. He took the darkest moment of his life and he practiced a little toda like we talked about last week. And he sang a praise of faith saying, even though this is the worst, he says, I choose to praise you anyway. I choose that you will bring good out of this. And he sang his tehillah, his personal song. That's touched so many of us, even before we heard the story, right? My friends, uh, we put it this way as the bottom line. We're talking about tequila. Uh, we, put, we put it this way. We'll put it on the screens that um, God is after a new song because God is after a you song. <laughs> this idea of singing a new song to God means that he wants you to sing a song that is your story. He wants you to sing your story, not something that rhymes, not something that sounds professional, but something that's authentic, gritty, real, dirt under the fingernails, uh, stained makeup on your face from the tears. He wants that kind of a song from you. God's after you singing a new song because he's after you singing a you type of song. That is what tequila is all about. 